Now, what about the North? As I said at the beginning of this lecture, racism has a history. It is not something that's outside of history. And the war seems to have produced some diminution in racial prejudice in the North. It's hard to quantify exactly. Um, the proclamation infused the war with a kind of a moral purpose. There was less fear of a tremendous influx of emancipated slaves moving up to the North as experiments. We'll talk about this when we meet next, next week, uh, next, two weeks. Uh, experiments began in using free labor on plantations in the South. So the idea that all these slaves were going to come up to the North began to diminish. Um, there was still racism. Nobody would, would deny that. And maybe the most dramatic evidence of it was the New York, was right here in New York City. In July 1863, the New York City draft riots, the largest civil uprising in American history other than the South's secession, where for three or four days, mobs rampaged in New York. It started out, as the name suggests, as opposition to conscription. And they were, you know, when, when the process began of drafting men, uh, the, the, the rioting took place, but it quickly turned into a general assault on the anti-slavery movement in New York, symbols of the Republican Party, including like the offices of the New York Tribune, and the black community of New York City, which numbered, I don't know, about 12,000 maybe around that time. And um, black homes were burned. Here's a couple of pictures of, uh, here's a picture from Harper's Weekly, different images of the New York City draft riots, burning of the, the, the most famous, the colored orphan asylum was burned to the ground. The children were taken out, but the colored orphan asylum was burned to the ground. Uh, mobs, you see, fighting police in the streets. And here's an image on the right of a, the hanging of a black man in, um, what's that, Clarkson Street. On the streets of New York, black people were lynched in July 1863. Many fled to New Jersey for safety. Many fled into Central Park. Troops had to be sent right after the Battle of Gettysburg. This takes place right after the Battle of Gettysburg to, put, to help put down the New York City draft riots. By the way, if you ever saw Gangs of New York, you know, you ever see that movie? The New York City draft riots take place in that. But the Union Navy did not bombard New York City in the draft riots as they did in that movie by Scorsese. Now, I had a former student, Tyler Ambinder, who worked as a kind of uh, advisor. He's a historian, teaches in Washington, worked as a advisor to the movie. And I said, how did, that, how did you let that get through, the Union Navy bombarding the, uh, the, the city? It didn't happen. He said, well, of course, I know it didn't happen. I told Scorsese it didn't happen. But he said, you know, that is an homage to the film by Eisenstein, Battleship Potemkin, <laughs> where the Russian Navy bombards St. Petersburg during the Revolution of 1905 or something. So that's the difference between history and movies. Just remember that. You know, it's, it was fine, but it, it's not history. But a year later, a year after the draft riots, the 20th U.S. colored troops raised in New York, marched down to the Battery to a giant parade and celebration to be sent off to fight in the South. So these are the two sides of the race situation in the North. Deep racism persisting, and yet also a celebration of the role of African American soldiers in uh, fighting in the war. Um, I think it's fair to say that the service of black soldiers helps to put on the agenda of the nation the question of black citizenship after the Civil War. By fighting and dying for the Union, they stake a claim to rights in the post-war world. Um, in a way, what we're seeing is the opening struggle of Reconstruction happening in the very end of the Civil War. In October 1864, a national African-American convention meets in Syracuse, New York, and they put forward a call for the right to vote, equal civil rights. Uh, the ag black agenda during Reconstruction is actually put forward toward the end of the, of the Civil War. Um, so let's just, uh, we can finish by, um, I want to quote you from Higginson 
again, quoting a, uh, a, a, one of the members of his unit, the uh, first South Carolina volunteers. He quotes this guy in his writing. He says, if we hadn't become soldiers, all might have gone back as it was before. Our freedom might have slipped through the two houses of Congress. President Lincoln's four years might have passed by and nothing been done. But now things can never go back because we have showed our energy and our courage and our manhood. There's that manhood again. They proved their manhood. Another thing is, suppose you had kept your freedom without enlisting in the army. Your children might have grown up free uh, and been well cultivated, so it was to be equal of any to, uh, to be equal to any business. But it would always have been flung in their face. Your father never fought for his own freedom. Never can they say that to this African race anymore. He says we showed them we could fight by their side. So this is the psychological liberation, the personal liberation, so to speak, that the community liberation that this becomes a central part of African-American culture in the post-war world and an essential justification, as we'll see when we get to Reconstruction, an essential justification for claiming the rights of citizenship uh, in the United States. 